Welcome in to the College Football Power Hour. Jason Fitz, Adam Brenneman, I am Caroline Fenton. And the goalposts are in the Cumberland River because Vanderbilt did the impossible. They shocked the world. Down goes number one Alabama in Nashville. Fitz, what do we make of it? Uh, this is one of the most stunning losses we've seen in what we knew would be one of the most chaotic years we will ever see in college football. And Brenneman, to me, this is a clear and simple statement that at, that at this point, Kalen DeBoer is not Nick Saban. And I know we <laughs> praised a lot of Nick Saban here, but man, I just got to say this. We don't see a Nick Saban team have a letdown. I cannot say that loud enough. He found the special sauce to get his team up for it. From the outset in this game, it just felt like Bama was flat. And I'm stunned that even after they sort of turned the motor on in the fourth quarter, they just couldn't get a stop. Defensively, they could never stop what yeah. Vandy was doing. I just, this is an embarrassing loss for Alabama. This is an embarrassing moment for the for the program. And frankly, it's an embarrassing moment for Kalen DeBoer, who we've Praised a lot on this show, but you can't let this happen. Could there be more polar opposite feelings how Alabama felt leaving the, the field against Georgia to leaving the field against Vanderbilt? I mean, top of the world, number one team in the country to now losing to Vanderbilt. Uh, I, I, you mentioned Nick Saban. I loved how Vanderbilt put on their scoreboard the Nick Saban line on, I think it was college game day, said the only place in the SEC that's not hard to play is Vanderbilt. Well, Alabama gets beat. At Vanderbilt and Fitz, their defense, Alabama's defense, where have they been the last six quarters of college football uh, that, that, that they played? The second half against Georgia, they were nowhere to be found. The And then all game against Vanderbilt. To give up 40 points to Vanderbilt, Vandy had four incompletions in this game. Vand uh, Alabama is way more talented than that. And there were bright spots for Alabama. I thought Jalen Milrow played pretty well. He was – Threw for 310 yards, had the touchdown. He can't turn the football over, can't have the interception, can't have the fumble that 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 got recovered by Vanderbilt. But the thing that Vanderbilt did on defense was they took away the Jalen Milrow run game that was so good against Georgia. Jalen Milrow was seven carries for 10 yards. That run game was such a big part of what Alabama does on offense, and Vanderbilt com completely took it away. It is an absolutely shocking loss for Alabama. And I think the defense stepped up when they needed to most. You just brought it up. That is what was so lethal about Alabama's offense against Georgia. It was Jalen freaking Milrow. We were all saying that after that game. That that's the difference between Alabama and Georgia or Alabama and every other team in the country is what Jalen Milrow doesn't just do for you with his arm, but also what he does with his legs. And this is a Vanderbilt defense that head coach Clark Lee has taken a lot more ownership over this season. He's a defensive-minded guy, former D.C. at Notre Dame. And it was some defensive hiccups at Georgia State that caused Vanderbilt to lose in, in kind of a heartbreaker and in a heartbreaking fashion there. So credit to Vanderbilt for taking that away, that that was their game plan. Very obviously, we're going to make Alabama beat us, but we're not going to let Jalen Milrose legs beat us. And to the point about Nick Saban uh, talking about how Vanderbilt's not a hard place to play. I love that they played that video over the Jumbotron as everyone is like storming the field after they won. Mwah, chef's kiss. Ultimate troll job from Vanderbilt because I don't think they to do that too often. So Caroline, everything you just said there is perfect and brilliant, but here's my big question for everybody. Thank you. I'm blushing. Like we we, we already <laughs> knew. Like we knew you got to shut down Jalen Milrow. Like we and I agree. Clark Lee comes with this big defensive resume. We understand what that defense can be. My question is, how the hell did Georgia not understand that a week ago? Like uh, there is some element to me where I'm watching a team that frankly should not be talented enough to be in this game in this game because there was a really good game plan by Vandy. But that also makes me look at it and say, how, Adam, did Georgia not also have an equally really good game plan? Like, this isn't rocket science. I, I was a little stunned to see that not only did Vandy get the best of Alabama from a coaching standpoint, but I don't think they suddenly unlocked the magic code that nobody else has seen. So why did it suddenly work now? Alabama clearly used their very best stuff with Jalen Milrow against Georgia, put it on film, and now Vanderbilt saw it, knew what to stop. Uh, there's also other reasons Alabama lost this game. Alabama lost the penalty battle, lost the turnover battle, lost the time possession battle 
brutally 17 minutes time of possession for Alabama. So you lose those three things, you're going to lose almost every game no matter who you play. Uh, you can't turn the football over two times and, and create zero turnovers with your defense. So there's a lot of reasons Alabama lost this game, a lot of things to be concerned about. But also remember, this is the Alabama team that just beat Georgia, What was up 28 nothing against Georgia. If it tells us anything, Caroline, I don't know who's good in college football right now. I can't. I, I have no no idea. Uh, I thought Alabama was the best team in the country. I've been riding high on them all year. They lose the to Vanderbilt. Who knows who the best teams are? We keep getting fooled. We thought Georgia was number one. The only thing I know is that Texas is really darn good, and Ohio State took care of business. Everyone else is up for grabs. That's exactly what I was going to say. Who's good in college football? It's Texas and Ohio State, and then on any other given night, you can lose to Vanderbilt. Like, like that's like that's exactly <laughs> where we are in all of college football. And obviously, in the grand scheme of things, you know, in a in a three hundred and sixty foot view of what this loss means, I still look at Alabama as a national title contender. I still look at Alabama as a team that can get to Atlanta and compete in the SEC and can compete in the college football playoff. This was just a really bad day at the office for Alabama. So everything that they want to do is still in front of them. But frankly. I'm just disappointed. Like I'm, I'm looking at Alabama, and I feel like oh, a parent. Oh, she busted that, like, out look, the disappointed line. I'm not oh, I'm mad. Not, I'm, I'm just disappointed. I'm, 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 I'm just disappointed. I'm not mad. I'm just pissed. No, I'm not. I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. That look, we were talking about this all week. We called this kind of a trap week. That hey, you know, look, Alabama, you're coming off of the biggest win in college football. Caitlin DeBoer is coming off of the biggest win of his career. Don't look past this game. This this pesky little Vanderbilt team with a quarterback that lets it fly and truly just does not give a single F. Like, do not look past this team because we know that Nick Saban coach teams would never do that. So it's disappointing that we could have all seen it coming, that you can't have a hangover after that Georgia game. And you got beat. You got trapped. But isn't that isn't that just a small crack in the armor to the benefit of the doubt that we constantly give Alabama? And this is like, look, I, I know finally last week was my awakening where I apologized to Bama fans and said, there's no cultural problem. You won't miss. You won't lose games that you shouldn't lose. It's fine. And then this turns around and happens. But to me, part of what we've just assigned here, because we know Kalen DeBoer is a great head coach, right? There's no question about that. We know that he can coach football and we know that Alabama's got a ton of talent. But these are the little things. These are the little things that were never even a mindset under Nick Saban. There was never even a conversation to be had about overlooking anybody under Nick Saban. It just didn't exist. And we've applied the Saban benefit of the doubt that we talk so much to, to Alabama because they've looked so good early in the season. They're rolling. These are the little cracks in that, though, that remind us all that this is the beginning of a new chapter, a new journey. And DeBoer's got to learn from this. Like This entire coaching staff has got to learn from this. This isn't just about the players. This is about everybody in Alabama's program, Adam, learning from this. You make a great point, Fitz, that for Kalen DeBoer, part of this is take a shot building the culture of your program because now for Alabama, we've seen when things have gone really well, them fold a little bit and not be able to handle the success. Look at the first half against Georgia, 28 nothing. Everyone thought they were great, feeling themselves on the sideline really get dominated in the second half, but find a way at the end of the game to still win the game against Georgia. Now they beat Georgia, a lot of success, become the number one team in the country, and lose on the road to Vanderbilt. Those kinds of things can't happen, wouldn't have happened, probably wouldn't have happened under Nick Saban, who was so good at building that discipline. So it's all a learning process for Kalen DeBoer, being the new head coach at Bama, what it looks like. Now, Nick Saban said this on college game day. Sometimes having these kinds of things are good early-ish in the season. So you can learn from it. So you can tell your team, we are not as good as you guys thought you were. We just lost to Vanderbilt, which is embarrassing. It's time to figure it out and play Alabama football. You look at Alabama's schedule, it doesn't get easy. I mean, they, they got mm -hmm. Tennessee, Missouri, LSU, back to back to back. They got Oklahoma at the end of the season. They, this schedule is not easy. No schedule is easy in the big, in, in the SEC, but Bama better figure it out. They're still alive very much so, to your point, Caroline. Still a national championship contender. Crazier things have happened. Ohio State 2014 lost week one, ended up winning the Natty. Things can happen like this, but Alabama better, better put it together. And when things go well, they have to find a way to hold it together and not have a letdown game. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Let, let's be brutally honest for a second. This loss means nothing to Alabama for the rest of this year. Nothing. <laughs> yeah. in, a, in a playoff expansion world, they are still going to be every bit part of the playoff conversation. 
They are still they still right now have the most quality win of the entire season. Whatever they fall in the AP poll won't be that far, and they won't fall that far in the minds of the committee. To the point you just made, Adam, they have so much football left ahead of them. I can't say this loud enough. Losing to Vanderbilt does not matter to Alabama. The, the, what they do the rest of the year will impact whether or not they make the college football playoff. I think if we all had to bet our houses, we would bet that they would, right? I think most people think that that's where they're going to end up. This Vandy loss has really no consequence for Alabama. They just got to take it and learn from it. Conversely, though, this Vandy win has a lot of consequence for Clark Lee, in my mind. Like, I was in that, I lived in Nashville when James Franklin and Vanderbilt turned around and upset Tennessee, and it changed the way everybody thought about Vanderbilt football. To me, Caroline, like, you're in Nashville right now. Like, it just feels like this is one of those landmark wins for a program that changes the way you see them. This is monumental for Vanderbilt. And I, I do want to touch on a point that you made, but I want to look at the Vanderbilt perspective because I'm, we're looking at history being made in the Vanderbilt football program that 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now, they are going to be talking about October 5th, 2024, when the number one team in the country came into West End and they got beat by Vanderbilt. This is the first time Vanderbilt has beaten Alabama since 1984. The first time in history, in program history, that Vanderbilt beat a top five team and it was the number one team nonetheless. Like we could go on and on and on with the lists of firsts or the lists of the reasons why this win is going to make history. But for a guy like Clark Lee, that and if anyone's not familiar with him, he lives, eats, breathes the city of Nashville and Vanderbilt University. He grew up in Nashville. He played at Vanderbilt. He talked about how this was his dream job. He's talked about how he believes in this football program. Let's be honest. I don't think there's a whole lot of people out there that do believe in the Vanderbilt the Vanderbilt football program. So for Clark Lee to get that win on his resume, for the fan base to feel invigorated and to enjoy not just winning football, but an exciting brand of football, I think is huge for an administration where, frankly, the patience was getting pretty short. So it's massive for Vanderbilt. Like, that cannot be understated. But to your point about this means nothing for Alabama, in the grand scheme of things, I, I would agree with you that Alabama can still go 11-1, and one, that this could be the kick in the butt that maybe this team needed to clean some things up, because let's talk about it. Three, not so great, kind of gross and gritty quarters against USF and the second half against Georgia Alabama was just kind of holding on and so now we have this game against Vanderbilt is this the wake-up call that this Alabama team needed or is this loss gonna set them down a spiral because what we knew about Nick Saban coach teams they were incredibly disciplined they weren't gonna get too high and they weren't gonna get too low not overly emotional this can be the kind of loss that can derail your season if you can't get everything back on track to that point though Caroline and and yes I think what we're learning is that maybe the great skill set that Nick Saban had was the true as basic as it sounds the true ability to make every week just that week and that is such a I, I, we say it in front of a microphone, but that's so against your intuition as a human being. Like, it's so hard not to stack wins, not to stack losses, to truly reset every single week. That's just something I think we took for granted for an entire generation of football. And now you learn like quickly that you can't take that for granted. And look, I, I'm not sitting here saying that, you know, every game in the SEC, you guys know that I've railed hard against the, well, you know, Kentucky is a tough game. It's the SEC. Iowa's a tough game. It's a big time. I hate that logic. The fact is, there are a lot of tough games left for Alabama. And to your point, yeah, an 11-1 Alabama is going to be fine. Probably a 10-2 and Alabama is going to be fine. Like, we can look at all this. But I think what really the question now is, is Alabama as a program, are they fine? Like, because this does at least create a little planted seed of doubt. And, man, I think the mentals on this are significant, Adam. Like, you played the game at, the, at this level. Like, Think about it. There's just a belief on the sideline that we can overcome anything and we can, met, like, so what? We dug ourselves a hole. We'll get through it. That's a belief in the sidelines. I never saw that belief kick in in the fourth quarter. I never saw a big stop when they needed a stop. They had the opportunity, no matter how many mistakes they made that you referenced earlier, in the fourth quarter, they had the opportunity to take this game, make this game theirs, and to shut Vandy down and they couldn't do it. To me, that's more significant than anything we're talking about because that little extra, whoa, 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 we're taking on Bama. We know how this is going to play out. That doesn't exist anymore. That was proven in this game. 
not being able to get a stop against Vandy when the defense needed to is an absolute morale killer. The other part that that's tough for Alabama is just the highs and the lows of the season. Young young kids, college players don't do well with uncertainty and high highs and lows a lot of times. And again, that's what Nick Saban was great at. Think about Alabama against South Florida. Then they come out and go up twenty eight nothing against Georgia. Then they get then they get dominated in the second half. Then they find a way to win the game, and now they lose to Vanderbilt. Man, these kids. It, there's a lot of ups and downs, a lot of looking around that locker room trying to figure out who they are. And this is a tough moment now for Kalen DeBoer in his career, an embarrassing loss. How do you rally this locker room together and give those kids some hope and some belief? There's still a lot of excitement. I mean, Jalen Milrow is still the best, one of the best two players in college football. Alabama controls its own destiny still. There's still a lot to play for. That's an embarrassing loss, but Kalen DeBoer has to find a way to kind of take some of that uncertainty out of these Alabama players' minds and say, we have to play up to our potential every single time we're out there. That's the sign of a great team. And right now, Alabama, we don't know which version of their team we're getting on the field any given Saturday. Even in a loss, too, we still saw some Ryan Williams plays that made my brain yeah. hurt. Like, uh, he had one catch right on the sideline, and I can't remember if it was for a touchdown. I believe it was. Right on the sideline, you probably picturing exactly what I'm talking about that made me say out loud, I feel like Ryan Williams would be really good at ballet. Like he's like a he's a gazelle. He is graceful. <laughs> he is smooth. Everything is in slow motion. And obviously that's not the number one talking point here. I understand Alabama just lost to Vanderbilt. Like let's talk about that. But side story, Ryan Williams still very good at the game of football. Did you know he's only 17? I I don't I, I don't know if that's what? been covered. I just yeah. Like, he's supposed to be in high school right now? Who knew that that was possible, right? Like, I I, I took a drink because every time uh, of water, I should know, uh, because every time we hear that he's 17, uh, th that's what uh, that's what I feel like we should do. But you're right. Like, even the the end around touchdown uh, run call, which I thought was just a great play call. That's one of those moments where that's a great play call because it worked. It's a great play call because a great player made a great play, you know, and. And that's the the funny thing. If you look at this, the, the weirdest part about college football this year, Caroline, is that if you look for what we saw in this and say, okay, what, what is sustainable? Like, how much of this will we take with us? There were sustainably some good things for Alabama. They're going to be fine. There were some su sustainably pretty good things for Vandy. I, I don't walk away from this suddenly thinking Vandy's about to shock the world and be the fifth best team in the SEC, though. You know, like, it felt like, if we played this 10 times, I'm not sure it plays out this way as we always do on this show. I'm not sure it plays out this way six out of 10 times. And I, I hate to dampen the party for Vanderbilt because uh, I can personally attest that there has been a big old party here in Nashville that they brought the, the goalpost down Broadway. I think That's a that long walk, by the way. That's a really long walk. It's what a, at least a mile, if not more. I mean, we're talking, what, 20, 25 blocks? It's a, it is not a, a short walk in the slightest, but bringing the, the goalposts down Broadway and the collective blood alcohol level in the city of Nashville is is reaching, you know, kind of cumbersome levels. Uh, but it, it's one of those that you say, Vanderbilt, enjoy it. This is going to be one that you're talking about for the rest of your lives. This is going to be one that the Vanderbilt program talks about for eternity, but it's not one that I look at that completely shifts my forecast for what the rest of this conference holds and what the rest of the season holds in terms of the college football playoff. I am also just glad that we got great Twitter content. According to maps from Acme Feed and Seed, which for anybody who doesn't know is right on First Avenue, uh, to Vanderbilt University. Right by the river. A, a, right by the river. Uh, for the walk is 2.1 miles. That's, I mean... <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a long walk. And then is everybody taking an equal portion of the goalposts? Like, or somebody, like, is everybody carrying the same amount of weight? Cause like, I'd be pretty bummed if I was halfway through and I felt like everybody wasn't equally carrying the goalposts. Those things are going to be heavy that far. I was kidding. Are goalposts heavy? I, I would think they have to be. It's not enough, field right? research that I've conducted for myself, but I would assume so. Dude, I'd have to root for a team that ever wins to know what it's like to, to, to rip the goalpost down. So I have, I have no idea. I, I can't. I can't speak to that one way or the other. I have no idea. I just feel like 
Yeah, and especially by the way, for a crowd that was outnumbered ten to one for Alabama fans inside that stadium, like for the the ten percent that was Vandy to get the opportunity to rip the goalpost down and then walk it to lower broad. I think what we're forgetting is that while they were doing that, they were walking through Alabama fans that were headed to lower broad to drink their misery. Right, like that's uh, that that stadium. We all heard it. That stadium was wildly roll tide. Right, like so seeing that moment, I can only imagine the trolling down roller, lower broad. That's what I really want. As they should. Vanderbilt fans don't get to do that very often, especially when it's from a fan base like Alabama. And just for context, you know, in the city of Nashville, this is where I live. I live l- half a mile away from where Vanderbilt plays football on Saturdays. Every single Saturday, I will see Auburn fans, Georgia fans, Alabama fans, Kentucky fans, and they are outnumbered. They outnumber Vanderbilt fans by an insane margin. It is it's an opportunity for a fan base to come to Nashville and enjoy the, you know, the nightlife, enjoy the scene, have a good time and watch your team win. Like that's always kind of what playing at Vanderbilt has been for so many SEC fan bases. So to go into this game with that mindset of we are the best team in the country. We just beat the big bad dogs. We've got Jalen Miller, the Heisman Trophy favorite, and we're going to come in here and absolutely just obliterate this team. Like, that is a different level of just embarrassment. Tuck your tail between your legs and just have to scratch your head and say, how did we get here? It's one of the things that stunned me when I moved to Nashville. What, it was 96 when I moved there. And I started, like, hanging out with everybody watching college football, and everybody was Vols fans. And I sat there, and I'm like, hey, guys, why are you rooting for a football team that's hours away when there's a football team, like, literally three blocks away and everybody laughed at me. They're like, you'll figure it out. It's Vandy. And like, that's real. You know, that that's very, for, for anybody that grew up in Nashville, they grew up UT fans. And uh, as you and I both worked in that local media landscape, you could spend all day sitting on radio talking about the Tennessee Volunteers. But if you start talking about Vandy, people are like, ah, who cares? Like, it's, it's wild. And uh, it's funny to me because part of the reason that James Franklin eventually left Vandy was because why would you want to continue to win football games somewhere that it just doesn't seem to resonate? He used to beg and plead for that stadium to be full. And at the time, I was just living there as a fan, like of, of the city, you know? And so it's just funny. I my, my hope is that this builds something special for Clark Lee and for what has now become a very transient city, for that transient city to fall in love with a, you know, this cute underdog story that they have in the backyard, you know? But it, it, whether that happens or not, nothing will take away the glory of beating the number one team in all the land. Like that is just such a rare, like there are moments that, that in Nashville sports history that they'll always talk about MTSU taking down Michigan state in the NCAA tournament was a, you know, such a significant moment. This will be a moment that Nashville sports always remembers because Vandy beat not just Bama, but they, it wasn't a down Bama team. They beat Bama when Bama was the best team in all the land. That's such a special moment for any school. And Alabama has not lost a game as the number one team in the country since they lost to Texas A&M in 2012, which I feel like is ironic because watching Diego Pavia, I get Johnny Manziel flashbacks. The uh, like j- drop back YOLO balls, j- like running like a chicken with his head cut off. The fact that after the game, Alyssa Lang, the sideline reporter for the SEC Network, you know, has him for a one on one interview and he's talking about, hey, Vandy, we effing lit and just like let some F bombs fly on live television. Like I-, I think they're calling it the Music City Manzel. And I love it. I love it. All timer for Vanderbilt today, taking down number one Alabama, but not the only undefeated top five SEC team to take an L to an unranked team on the road. Tennessee falls to Arkansas 19 to 14. Adam, and we've seen Arkansas's defense get after Tennessee I think better than any other team that we've seen so far on Tennessee's schedule. And it's hard to imagine this Tennessee offense struggling the way it did against against Arkansas. I mean, couldn't get anything going. Nico Yamalieva couldn't get anything going down the field. The run game struggled. Tennessee with 10 penalties in this game. I mean, just got really dominated in the trenches by Arkansas. This Arkansas defense is is for real. Now, Arkansas sits at 4-2 and two as well, so they're a solid football team, but absolute chaos at the top of college football. We talked about it, Caroline. Who's good in college football right now? And Tennessee, I would have told you, coming into today is one of those legitimate teams that can score on anybody, only puts up 14 points against Arkansas on this game. Yeah, and by the way, we talked about time of possession. 
time of possession was a killer in this game too. Like in the yeah. first half, Tennessee couldn't get the ball and hold the ball long enough to really do anything with it. This was a three nothing game at the half, which just felt ugly and gross throughout the course of it. But sneaky throughout all of it. Like I've been really high on Tennessee's defense all year. I know they only gave up 19 points, but they gave up 431 yards. Like th this defense couldn't get off the field when they needed to get off the field. Like uh, oversimplification of everything, Caroline. But life really is about third down. You're either converting third downs and staying on the field on offense, and not and not allowing the other team to do it on defense, and you're winning. Or you've got the opposite. Like this just felt like one of those games where Tennessee got in their own way. And this is different than Alabama to me because, as we all know, this is part of take a shot, Tennessee's culture. Like, Tennessee losing this game is something that happens every damn year. This is my frustration, or what I feel like the Tennessee fan base frustration is. Look, Josh Heupel is a wonderful coach, and Josh Heupel has gotten Tennessee not just relevant in college football again, but has made them a really, really good football team year after year after year. Like, Tennessee's finally experiencing success for the first time in a long time. But Every year, Tennessee loses a stupid game on the road that they're not supposed to lose. Obviously, Arkansas this season. Last year, they went on the road and lost in the swamp, a penalty-ridden game to a Florida team that didn't even make a bowl game. The year before, Tennessee was the number one team in the country at one point in the season, the best offense in the country under Hendon Hooker and Jalen Hyatt and Cedric Tillman and, and that whole squad in 2022. Well, they go on the road to a South Carolina team that was not very good and gave up 50-something yeah. points to a South Carolina offense that I don't think had scored that many points collectively in the season. So I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's discipline on the road. Like you mentioned, Fitz, 10 penalties today in Fayetteville. I don't know if it's an intimidation factor. I don't know if there's a different story to each and every one of those games. I'm sure there's probably a little bit of truth to all of that. But this is a Tennessee team that I know still controls their own destiny, that has opportunities to build up their resume with some marquee games throughout the rest of the season. But this just isn't one that you wanted to see them lose because now the margin for error shrinks against Georgia and Alabama throughout the rest of their schedule. The really shocking part about Tennessee in this game was just the lack of explosion they had on offense. It's what they've been so good at under Josh Heupel. Fitz, you mentioned the third down situation. I would argue that first and second down for Tennessee is way more important than third down. How many first downs are you getting on first and second down? I just saw a stat by, by one of those football anal analytics companies that talked about how actually the best teams get those first downs on first and second down and stay out of third down altogether. Tennessee with only 16 first downs in this game. Arkansas with 23 and then yards per pass for Tennessee 5.4 yards per pass that you should be running the ball for 5.4 yards a rush not throwing the ball for 5.4 and and we've seen Tennessee be way more explosive than this so yes Tennessee controls their own destiny but their entire program their entire winning formula revolves around being explosive on offense being able to play fast getting a bunch of points per play and that's not the team we saw against Arkansas yeah and Nico Iamaliava has got to learn from this too like I I I'm frustrated with the way this game ended. I mean, you saw Hypo used a, a timeout that I don't think was six seconds left to get them in the right play on fourth down. During that timeout, there has to be communication with the quarterback. Hey, we don't have a lot of time. We got to get rid of the ball quickly. It's got to be on time because you didn't have any timeouts left at that point. And instead of that happening, Nico runs around, tries to make something happen. And then it's almost like he just forgot the situation because he finally he ran past the line of scrimmage, yeah. left himself no choice. Mm -hmm and runs out of bounds as the clock hits zero. And it's like, you, you just, you can't put yourself in that situation. He's a young kid playing quarterback. One of the things we've talked about is eventually he was going to have a young kid playing quarterback game. It's just, man, now all the wiggle room is gone. You, if you were going to have that game, I'd rather you had it against one of the best teams that you can learn from. Instead, you had it against Arkansas. And it's just, this, this takes away some of the shine on a kid that's played really, really well so far this year. This is a, a welcome to the big leagues kind of moment for Nico Yamaliava. And it happens for every young quarterback, no matter how great or how much NIL money they make or how many stars <laughs> were next to their name coming out of high school. It happens for every young quarterback. It just so happened that happened for Nico Yamaliava in a absolute have to have it moment. You have to convert on that fourth down. You know that the clock is winding down. You're at the Arkansas 20. You have to throw the football and for him to keep it and run it and run out of bounds when he needed 
started five and only got four. It's a, it's a rookie kind of mistake. I still think that Tennessee is a very, very good and very complete football team. But Fitz, I remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, and, and you brought up, but you know, what's Tennessee's weakness? Because through a few weeks, it didn't look like that Tennessee really had any weaknesses. And I thought at this point, Tennessee's biggest weakness might just be the lack of experience for their starting quarterback at Adam. We, we saw that come to fruition here. But Adam, I do want to get your perspective on what you think uh, uh, Tennessee is moving forward. Yeah, I, I still have a lot of faith in Tennessee. And I think a loss like this actually isn't the end of the world for Tennessee. To have it happen to your young quarterback when you're still in the first, what, five, six weeks of the season it is a good thing. At some point, the SEC is all going to beat up on each other. I mean, guys, we only have a few teams that, that have an unbeaten SEC record right now. I mean, Tennessee just lost. Alabama and Georgia both have, have SEC losses. The only ones that don't have a loss are Texas, LSU, and Texas A&M. So, for Tennessee to have this experience early on and for Nico Amaleva to have that kind of bonehead moment where you don't throw the ball to the end zone, don't try to, don't try to, when you don't even give her a chance to win the, yourself a chance to win the game at the end, you rep those end of game situations in practice so much all the time. Every Thursday before a game, you're repping last play scenarios, fourth down scenarios, when you gotta have it, you hail Mary, lateral plays, all that stuff. There is nothing like doing it when the lights are bright. And everyone's watching on TV, and it's a real game. So for him to actually get that experience and now be able to go watch that film and say, man, I got to be better, actually makes me feel pretty good about Tennessee moving forward because I wasn't sure how I felt about this team. The one area of concern, as I said, is that explosion on offense and how much they struggled to move the ball in this game. I, I believe this will be a fluke and that Tennessee will get back to playing Tennessee football the rest of the season. Yeah, I should note, though, Nico had a couple big overthrows on big plays down the field, too, like, it's a yeah. game to forget for him, but I think we're right. And I will echo the same sentiment. You can just clip it off from what I said it earlier and post it right here. This game means nothing to Tennessee because if they go out and take take care of business the rest of the season, they're still going to be a college football playoff team. Like That's one of the beautiful things about expansion and one of the beautiful things about the way that everything's running, even with the SEC taking the top two teams without divisions. Like This game truly won't mean anything if Tennessee goes in and takes care of business. But you both made a really important point that matters here with Tennessee particularly. They got to do that. Like the the wiggle room yeah. is gone for Tennessee. So they the unfortunately they just use their entire savings account on this one so they can't have anything <laughs> else go wrong. It, the the wiggle room shrinks because Tennessee does still have Alabama and Georgia left on their schedule. Let's yeah. say Tennessee hypothetically those were the only two games that they lost. A 10 and 2 Tennessee team that has looked the way that they have looked for a majority of the season, I think has a very strong case to get into the college football playoff. But if Tennessee loses those two games in addition to the loss tonight, I don't think a nine and three Tennessee team is getting in where the best win on your schedule is what at Oklahoma that pulled their quarterback in the middle of that game. So that's the biggest, that's I think, fair. repercussion for, for Tennessee moving forward. But it, it, still win those games. <laughs> Obviously, anything can happen in college football. <laughs> and we saw that today. So we'll continue that conversation after a quick break. We call today kind of the, uh, the just the survive in advance day, the uh, the recipe for chaos day on a day in college football that everybody wanted to say was a bad slate. We got pure and utter chaos. So Adam, what did we learn today on our uh, Saturday of chaos? I learned that Ole Miss, despite their loss against Kentucky, is still for real. Uh, I wanted to see how Ole Miss and Jackson Dart would bounce back after that tough loss. Jackson Dart did not play well against Kentucky. And then for Ole Miss to come out and beat South Carolina, who's who's played pretty well this season, South Carolina themselves, uh, 27-3. to Jackson Dart to throw for 285 yards, not turn the football over. Ole Miss to play a complete team. And I was curious to see how Lane Kiffin and these guys would bounce back and if Ole Miss would look like a top 10 team in the country in this game. And they did. And it goes to show, again, to your point, Fitz, some of these losses early on in the season aren't that big of a deal and can be a good thing. They were talking about it, Nick Saban today on TV, about how he a lot of times wished that those those Alabama teams would lose a game early and prove to your guys, man, you got to play better. I, I think that was the moment for Lane Kiffin and for Jackson Dart. And, and Jackson Dart also improved on some of those time management mistakes. On the uh, At the end of the first half, I thought he managed the clock really well. I thought he managed it well as the game went on. So I didn't see that against Kentucky. Improved on it. This was a better Ole Miss team. And I'm a believer in Ole Miss again after this weekend. I also love, you're, you're noticing a trend. And I hadn't thought about this until you just spoke about it. 
But frankly, the sky is falling every time we see a team lose every week until you realize that everybody's taking a loss. So now yeah. with every like I just don't know that there's going to be anybody that can get through this college football season undefeated. So whereas one loss feels like it's just catastrophic for each team the week they take it, you're right. Like the market resets a little bit on Ole Miss now because now we've seen other teams also lose a game. So it, it is interesting how maybe the the message for everybody is like, hey, it's not about the loss, it's about how you rebound from the loss that will define the rest of your season. Can we talk about South Carolina faking a punt on their first possession in their own territory? Shane Beamer. Nah, I, on. Shane Beamer. I, I, Beamer ball, baby. Beamer ball giveth <laughs> and Beamer ball taketh away. Like, we have seen some of the most insane special teams play from Shane Beamer coach teams and Frank Beamer coach teams. I'll add to that, too. And then we see stuff like this that just leaves me just uh, so puzzled. Like, what? Shane! What are we thinking? What are you doing? What are we doing? <laughs> Just line up and, and convert. We don't have to get cute with it. Uh, my goodness. Uh, but Fitz, what did you learn today? So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be the one to, to talk on this because I think Adam can't without getting too much hate on social media. <laughs> I, I learned today that we need to give a little bit more respect, put a little bit more respect right now on the words Penn State. And the funny thing is, mm. to me, it's because they were kind of one-dimensional. Like, they didn't run the football particularly well today, and it didn't matter. Like, when you see a team that's a little one-dimensional, that's having a hard time putting it all together, and they still go out and they just thump you, that means something to me. So when everything wasn't necessarily flowing the right way, I still watched Penn State, and I thought, man, there's an ease to the way that they drive the football. Drew Aller is throwing the ball so well right now. They're utilizing their weapons all over the place in a way that I think really matters. Spreading the ball out to a lot of different targets, which I also really respect. It's just there's a comfort in this offense for the passing game, and on a day where they didn't run the ball particularly well, instead of looking at that saying, well, this is a deficiency, I keep thinking, man, we've seen a lot of teams fold this year, and what we haven't seen from Penn State is any moment where it felt like the moment was getting the best of Penn State. I'm starting to really sit back and say, hey, like I think they're going to jump in the polls this week. I know UCLA sucks. Yeah. It's not about that. It's about who Penn State is and the way they looked in this game. I think that they're being undervalued right now. Yeah, Penn State's a legit team, man, and and they played really well in this game on all three phases. Penn State has a formula for how they're going to win, and they have a, a method for controlling the ball on offense, but also now the added part to this Penn State team they didn't have the last couple of years is the, the explosive plays down the field. Drew Aller can now push the ball down the field and has the playmakers to make those plays. And to your point, Fitz, Penn State did not run the ball today very well at all. I think average two point some yards of carry, but the encouraging part is when one piece when, when one piece isn't working, to have the other parts in place to overcome it. Drew Aller went through for 237 yards and a touchdown. Liam Clifford. Remember remember Sean Clifford? You know, Liam Cl Sean Clifford's brother, Liam, is a wide receiver now at Penn State. Liam Clifford went for, for 100 yards, had a touchdown. Now, there to me... There had to be me, a Clifford uh, for, at Penn State for what? Every year over the forever. last 37 I mean, Sean was there years? For, <laughs> Sean was there for seven years. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> Liam, Liam's playing well and, and is now emerging kind of as the wide receiver one at Penn State. And I'm excited now to see Penn State go on the road for the first time since week one to USC. I know USC just lost today, which is another surprising upset. But I want to see Penn State go on the road and put a complete game together and go against a high-powered offense like USC has where Penn State's going to have to score a bunch of points and see if they can keep up. I believe they will. I believe they, they can. And, and Fitz, their defense is legit. So oh, yeah. I think Penn State's, Penn State's for real and, and has a chance to now crack into probably the top six teams. I think Penn State absolutely is for real. And I'm with you that they're not being talked about. And I want to know why. Like, it's just, it, has nobody watched Penn State? Have they not played a sexy enough opponent for it to be appointment watching like we have with so many other teams that we've been talking about today or throughout the rest of the season? I mean, that Illinois game is probably the one game that comes to mind of most people would have watched that game on Penn State's schedule over any other game, but I, I is it the lingering effect of Penn State's always going to be Michigan and Ohio State's little brother in the Big Ten? I don't know what that mentality is. I, I really think it is. It's a, it's a good question. The issue with Penn State to everyone nationally is that Penn State will always be the third best team in the Big Ten, and Penn State for the last 
six, seven, eight years has always barely missed the college football playoff. And I saw some stat that Penn State, if there was a 12-team playoff over the last like six years of college football, Penn State would have made the playoff like five out of the six years. Uh, So Penn State's always been in that range, but no one's really had them in that elite conversation in college football. But now with the playoff, Anything can happen. And there's a real chance here where Penn State's hosting a first-round playoff game come first round of the college football playoff. So it's completely different for Penn State now. And it's time people start talking about them as a legit contender in, in, in this national championship race. I think in fairness, part of the reason they haven't gotten attention to is the way the matchups have gone through the schedule. Like, we had a, a not insignificant matchup brand-wise between Texas and Michigan. A lot of people paid attention to that. People pay attention to Alabama, Georgia. People are paying attention today to upsets all over the place. So these stories sort of resonate over just a regular Big Ten matchup. This is what happens, I think, a lot of times to the Big Ten. And I, it starts changing this week. Like, the fact that we get Oregon and Ohio State as a, a real – like, that next week is going to be a juggernaut matchup that everybody will be faced uh, – will be focused on. And then when we start to get the Penn State versus Ohio State matchups, like, that's what – it always feels like this happens. Early in the season, a lot of SEC love. Middle of the season, a lot of Big Ten love. So I think that – I think there's about to be a swell of support for Penn State. Caroline, what did you learn this week? I learned that we all – collectively as a college football society, counted Texas A&M out way too early. That after they lost to Notre Dame at home after week one, I feel like we all just kind of washed our hands of the Aggies and said, okay, they're not a very good football team, out of sight, out of mind, and they're not any sort of contender. But I learned today that that was very much so a mistake when they stomped all over Missouri, took them down 41 to 10. And I know it was at home, but Missouri's a top 10 team in the country. Shouldn't be. And I think that we've learned that today. Uh, yeah, we learned Missouri sucks about, today, but go ahead. Yeah, we, we, we've known that. It's also we've something that. that we learned. And that's why whenever I kind of took a step back from this matchup and I thought, is this more about A&M or is it more about Missouri? I ultimately thought it was more about A&M. How many times have we talked about Missouri over the past couple of weeks of how unimpressed we have been with this team that's supposed to be a college football playoff contender and is a top 10 team in the country? Barely hang on against Boston College. It took a missed field goal in overtime to beat Vanderbilt, which honestly after today (laughs) might look like a better win. Joking. Uh, Maybe a little bit of seriousness there. But uh, but Missouri came into this game with a top 20 run defense. And Texas A&M ran for 236 yards and five touchdowns and averaged six and a half yards a carry. Like, that is insane. And Connor Wigman came back in in this game. Connor Wigman obviously had a rough game against Notre Dame. He got injured. Marcel Reed, the backup, came in. He added this level of explosiveness to the offense that we didn't see with Connor Wigman because of what he could do with his legs. So frankly, I thought Mike Elko was a crazy person for putting Connor Wigman back out there, but I thought he looked great today. The run game was doing its job, so you didn't have to ask Connor Wigman to do too much. He didn't commit some of the fatal mistakes that he did against Notre Dame. Overall, Texas A&M's defense is elite. They sacked Brady Cook six times today. Brady Cook couldn't get anything going. Missouri's run game couldn't get anything going. And that's a two-headed monster where Nate Noel and Marcus Carroll could go off at any point. So I think Texas A&M showed us that they're a much more complete football team than we've given them credit for. Yeah, and Connor Wigman looked like a completely different player to your point, Caroline, 18 to 22, almost 300 yards passing through for three touchdowns. Then this Texas A&M schedule plays out pretty well for them. Yes, they have Texas at the end of the season, which will be an unreal game, historic matchup between those two, but they don't play Alabama, don't play Georgia. So Texas has a Texas A&M has a real chance here to kind of run the table and make a name for themselves. They're now three and zero in the SEC. Uh, the, the one thing I definitely learned, you just alluded to it, Caroline, Missouri, is not a top 15 team. They should fall below the top 20 for this loss. Think about when Clemson lost to Georgia in week one. Clemson fell to the to the I think 25th ranked team in the country after that after that loss. Uh, and they were down six nothing at halftime. Missouri got ran off the field in this game. It was 24 nothing in the second quarter and did not get any prettier from there on out. The bottom line for me for Missouri is they had 30 rushing attempts and under 70 yards rushing. Not going to get it done. Won't get it done against Auburn, let alone Alabama, let alone Oklahoma, let alone any of you know, their, their next few SEC opponents. So uh, Missouri is not a top 20 team in college football. We've said that for a while on this podcast. They barely hung on against Boston College. Uh, and then Vandy now got exposed by Texas A&M Fitz. Yeah, and I would just add to that. I think if you're listening to this pod for the first time, 
it's been pretty clear that we're all low on Missouri and I think we were all higher on A&M than where the rankings show right now. This, this to me is part of what we need to, this, I'm going to keep preaching this, like patience is a virtue, you know, and in a beautiful world, we could sit there and take all of our results in like three or four week groups and say, okay, now what do we really know? Unfortunately, we don't have that opportunity, but this is yet again, a screaming example of why the AP poll shouldn't even exist until mid October, because it, it was so clear that this was wrong. And it was clear to me that AP voters were looking at box scores and not watching the game to have Missouri ranked as high as they were ranked. It, it, they didn't belong ahead of the teams that they were ahead of. Now it's been cleared up. The mess has been cleared up, but it shouldn't have happened in the first place. It's, we learned that the, AP voters need more time. I will I will die on this hill every week. They need more time to put their votes in so they can actually watch the games instead of just voting based on what they're reading in a box score. From your lips to the college football God's ears, Fitz, nothing makes me more angry in this sport than a team that everyone thinks is going to be good getting the benefit of the doubt for the better part of six weeks. When we've all seen it with our eyes, Missouri's not a top 10 team, but everyone thought they were going to be good. They were, what, preseason six, I believe, give or take. Uh, and so they just held on to that because they haven't lost a game until this the, this loss at Texas A&M. They squeaked by against Boston College. They squeaked by against Vanderbilt. So technically, they didn't do anything to drop out of the top 10, but it was, it's, it was the preseason, you know, Thoughts, preconceived notions that we had about this team. But did you see the the epic troll job from uh, Texas A and M cornerback Will Lee? His his oh, nickname the is towel. the with blanket, the yeah. and he yeah. left a blanket in a note <laughs> in Theo Weiss, Missouri wide receiver's hotel room, and like. I don't, I don't know. It, I, there's been some speculation that it wasn't actually him, that it was just some fan that thought it would be a funny prank. But if it was him, then uh, then touche. And you can you can talk Le- that talk legendary. if you walk that walk. Legendary. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Uh, all right. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back in a sec. All right, Fitz, who are you raising a glass to? Uh, somebody that, you know, we've mentioned a little bit on this show, but need to mention more. Ashton Gentry, the running back of Boise State. Uh, continues to just absolutely destroy everybody. And it's funny, we we were looking at some of his work uh, for one of the pieces I did for Yahoo on the site, and it's just incredible the numbers he's putting up and how much meaning it has right now for Boise State. Like they are, we talked earlier about one-dimensional. I won't say Boise State's one-dimensional, but they know what they're doing and they know how they're doing it and they do it by running the ball with him. I think absolutely the way he is running, I know we devalue running backs, Adam, but the way he is running the ball right now needs to be recognized. It needs to be seen. It needs to be talked about. He is clearly a Heisman Trophy candidate and he is doing things that absolutely no one knows how to stop him. Even when you get hands on him, you can't bring him down. What he's doing right now is special. Yeah, and he has every skill set you want in a running back. He's got the speed, he's got the power, the contact balance, the vision. If you could make a running back in a lab right now, it'd be Ashton Genty. And just what he's done, his numbers this season. I just saw a graphic that he's outpacing Barry Sanders' numbers through the first Jeez. first five six games of the season, the, the the year that Barry Sanders won the Heisman Trophy. So uh, it, it is truly remarkable and historic what he's doing. And Fitz, Boise State is my heavy favorite to be the group of five team that makes the college football playoff. I, I, I see Boise State winning out. I think they're going to beat UNLV and then get rewarded. You know, they have that loss against Oregon, but a, a good loss, if we if we can call it that, and and see how this thing all plays out. I think we'll see Boise State in the college football playoff and then Ashton Gentry on a huge stage uh, to kind of, you know, continue to solidify himself as the best running back in college football. I mean, he had what 186 rushing yards at halftime. Crazy. Like that's a stupid yeah. stat total for the entirety of a game. That's a solid stat total for two full games of work for an RB one. Much less what he's doing at halftime. I mean, it yeah, is, and that's the second man. lowest total of the year, by the way. Second lowest yeah. total of the year. <laughs> that's insane. And he's had a, a thousand yards before he's hit a hundred carries. Over a thousand rushing yards and ninety carries, Crazy. just truly, truly insane. But who we uh, who we pouring out one for Fitzy? Well, originally I was going to pour one out for UNLV uh, Friday night. Obviously, a heartbreaking loss in overtime to Syracuse that probably uh, ends their playoff dreams. But today I watched really, really pathetic football 
for much of the game from Michigan. So I'm pouring one out for Michigan. Like it, it is time yeah. to we just what we saw today the fatal flaw it's that time. Adam has mentioned a million times. Like when you are one dimensional and you cannot throw the football, what happens when you're down 14 nothing in the game? You make a quarterback change and you try and throw the football. And then even late in the game, when they had a chance to to try and win this thing, I just don't feel like Michigan right now. They've got three quarterbacks, and none of them are good enough. Like it's just they are they are absolutely hosed at the most important position in the sport. That I didn't believe. We talked about Missouri earlier, Adam. I never believed Michigan was a top ten team. I certainly don't believe that they're belonging anywhere near that conversation now. And they prove that their season, their playoff hopes, I think, died today with a loss. The fact that Michigan has now run three quarterbacks out there in five, <laughs> six games so far this season. And none of them have hit the 150-yard passing mark in any game that they have played is astonishing. (laughs) Astonishing. They cannot throw the football. I don't understand it, Adam. Yeah, I mean, Michigan's playoff hopes are over. Uh, They don't have a quarterback. I'll die on this hill that that one of the biggest mistakes of Stroh Moore's a uh, short tenure as Michigan's head coach will be not attacking the transfer portal and bringing in a big time quarterback for this Michigan offense. And it's a it's a reflection on Alex Orgy and how he's performed. He hasn't been what everyone thought he was going to be. And then Jack Tuttle, who showed good things today, but there's he's not good enough to be the starting quarterback at the defending national championship program. And Michigan's too one dimensional. So when you don't play a, a lights out in the run game, uh, then you have no other, nothing else to lean on. So I, I've been low on Michigan for a while. You guys know that. I, I don't think Michigan's defense is as good as they were last year. Cle- clearly not giving up 27 points to Washington. But let's give a lot of credit too to Jed Fish and what he's doing at Washington. Four and two now. Uh, had a couple of tough losses, but Will Rogers, their quarterback, is playing really well. Threw from his 300 yards today, and at home beat the defending national champions 27 to 17. Impressive job by Jed Fish in in, in year one. Who are you raising a glass to, Adam? Raising a glass to SMU. There was a lot of hype. A lot of hype around SMU. Yeah, a, a lot of hype early in this early in the season in the offseason around SMU. Preston Stone coming back had some of the best numbers in college football, uh, and then they start off pretty slow. Struggle against Nevada. They lost to Boston College. Preston Stone gets benched for Kevin Jennings, and then they have not looked back since that moment. Uh, beat TCU on the road, scoring sixty six points in that game. Uh, SMU demolishes Florida State, which you know who knows what that really means. But then get a, get a ranked win against Louisville to get the five and one, and now two and zero oh in ACC play. I, I thought I saw Jennings, their their new quarterback, uh, press conference or, or interview after the game, and he said we showed today that this is what we can do in the ACC, and I think he's right. Threw for two hundred eighty one yards and. Now SMU doesn't play Miami or Clemson, and they just won the toughest game left on their schedule sitting at 2-0 in conference play. SMU has a real legitimate shot at this thing at at winning the ACC title. Yeah, as you say that, Adam, that's what hit me watching it was Louisville has so much on the line, and I think Louisville's been getting a lot of cred for for a lot of good reasons. That's a good football team. But as I was watching SMU, I was like, man, this has all the makings of Holy cow, SMU just made the college football playoff. Like, the, the, yeah. when you start to look at the path and the journey to get there, you know, I know obviously you got to give a little love to Clemson, who you know, I've also been very tough on. Uh, Clemson has managed to rebound their season nicely, but SMU has put themselves in a very good situation to be representing the ACC in the college football playoff, which Caroline is wild to be saying. It, it is. And I went on a, a radio show on Charlotte on Friday and they asked me who's the third best team in the ACC, obviously behind Clemson and Miami. And I said Louisville. But I said, I think that there is one, a significant drop off between the top two teams in the conference and that kind of next middle group. And also there's a very strong argument to be made for several teams in the ACC to be the quote unquote third best team. And I think what SMU did on Saturday night just kind of solidifies that. I mean, Louisville going into this game has a very good defense. The 17th ranked total defense in all of college football. And SMU scored on every single one of their possessions in the first half. (laughs) I mean, it wasn't like a fluky thing. It wasn't like an overwhelming advantage one way or another in the turnover margin or with penalties. SMU just straight up could carve through Louisville's defense. Yeah, it's impressive. We'll see what happens the rest of the season for SMU, but they they 
we talk about controlling their own destiny. And I know you guys know I love the schedule game more than anybody. I'm, I'm always bringing <laughs> up the schedule on here. Facts. SMU schedule ain't that hard the rest of the, well, the rest of the way out. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Caroline, I'm going to tell you, I'm pouring one out now for Oklahoma State. Oklahoma it's State. Time. It's time. Uh, I don't know what's happening at Oklahoma State. I don't know what Mike Gundy is doing. But another preseason highly regarded team now sitting at 3-3 three and three after starting 3-0 and oh with three, let, let's be blunt, non-competitive losses against Utah, Kansas State, and the dagger today losing 38-14 to 14 against West Virginia. Uh, yes, the Big 12 is bonkers. Anything can happen in the Big 12, but I don't think it's this bonkers. Oklahoma State can't survive this one. Al- Ollie Gordon was supposed to be a- Ashton Genty, and it was supposed to be doing what he's doing right now. And, and Ollie Gordon has been essentially non-existent this season so far. He had 50 yards rushing today, doesn't have a touchdown since September 7th. I just saw that someone tweeted that. I mean, crazy. Whoa. Their quarterback, Alec Bowman, hasn't played well. There just doesn't seem to be a ton of hope on this this team. And then now they get the, the pleasure of traveling to BYU after their bye week and have five more tough conference games after that. So it's over the season for Oklahoma State. So let, let, let's all pour pour one out for them. Yeah, I'll pour say one simply out. on this. Mike Gundy, the uh Mike Gundy, the personality is better this year than Mike Gundy, the coach. Oh, and the three in that big <laughs> 12 is not is not acceptable. This is not what they wanted there. This is this is an yeah. abject disaster for this program. What's worse, the Mike Gundy headlines this year or the Mike Gundy coaching job this year? Yeah. Yeah. Well, fair maybe we should just put a wait on totally when we're like, for like, I, I, I want, but win some games before we have to listen to any more headlines. Caroline, uh, like, let, let's uh, who are you raising a glass to? Let's get positive. I'm raising a glass to Ohio State because on mm. a day. That felt like Trap Saturday on a day that we saw the number one team in the country lose to the team that's the butt of everyone's jokes in the Southeastern Conference. When we saw an unbeaten top five Tennessee team lose on the road, we saw USC get upside, upset by Minnesota. We saw a lot of massive you know, seismic shifts in certain conferences and the way that we look at these teams kind of games. When Ohio State just went in and took care of business against Iowa. Yeah, against Iowa, excuse me. So it feels kind of funny to give props to a team for just taking care of business and doing what they're supposed to do. But it seemed like Ohio State was one of the only top five, top 10 teams in the country that was able to do that. And I think the other thing that was super impressive to me was we've been talking about it the past few weeks. Ohio State hasn't played anyone. They ain't played nobody, Paul. So this was their first test this season against a good Iowa team that's had a little bit of a renovation offensively that's really good at running the football. And Ohio State was able to limit them in the ground game. They limited them to seven points. This is an Iowa team that's averaging 30-plus points a game. So Ohio State just gets snaps, kudos, a little pat on the back because you didn't get beat when everybody else in college football did. Yeah, I love, by the way, I love the way they ran the football in this. Like, to me, part of this was just about, we know Iowa's defense is going to be good. Didn't matter. I mean, they just came out and said, you know what? Will Howard, by the way, I was thinking of Adam, who said, you know, he's going to start his Heisman. Uh, He was really efficient (laughs) in this game. I thought thought Will played a really good game. But the story of this game was they just lined up and said, you know what, Iowa? I think you're known for your defense. And so what we're going to do is we're going to spend the next three to three and a half hours demoralizing you on every single snap. Like, they just absolutely got a couple of running backs that go off in this thing. They get over five yards of carry. And I was stunned the number was only that. I mean, you talk about 40 rushes for 203 yards. I thought it was going to be worse than that. When I actually looked at the box score, I was stunned it was that low. This was a thorough, just ass whooping that was given to Iowa. And I think it was a statement by Ohio State saying, you know what? We can come out and out tough you. We can out physical you. We, we will demean you to, through the course of this process, and we will absolutely win the game however we choose to. You know, Ohio State wore down Iowa throughout this game, but the, if there's any concern I have about Ohio State, it's just that this was a 7 nothing game at halftime. And, and, I wanted to see Ohio State come out a little bit faster, a little bit stronger in this game. It, yes, I love how they wore them down and how Will Howard played efficiently, but Ohio State hasn't played anyone this season. And when this game was 7 nothing at halftime, I was, oh boy, is Ohio State not going to be the team we thought they were? I'm not saying that Ohio State ended up dominating this game. Uh, as you said, Fitz, Will Howard played efficient, played played really well, 21 of, I think, 26 or 27 passing. So was really efficient, took care of the football, 
threw for a handful of passing touchdowns. So this uh, this Ohio State offense is for real, but they started slow. And in this in their tough stretch of Big Ten play, when they play Penn State next week, when they play Oregon, Ohio State can't start slow in those games. And Will Howard ultimately is going to have to play his very best football of his career. So we'll, we'll see what Ohio State team we get the first half or second half version against Iowa. Caroline, who are we pouring one out to? I'm pouring one out for AP poll voters. <laughs> Fitz I loves that. Fitz loves that one. Man. <laughs> I don't know where how you approach this. I think, and just full disclosure to everyone listening, we record this podcast on Saturday nights. So by, by the time you're listening, the AP poll may already be out and be updated. But I think we can guess Texas, number one team in the country. Ohio State, probably two. Who goes in that third slot? Because it was, you know, a Texas two, Ohio State three. Obviously, Alabama's going to fall. Tennessee was at four. I don't expect Tennessee to be in the top five anymore after getting beaten by a, an unranked team. Like, does Georgia, just by, you know, reaping the benefits of everyone else losing, now get slated into that three spot? Is it Oregon? Is it Penn State? Like, I, I, I don't know how the rest of the top ten looks. I have a hard time putting Oregon in that three spot because I think we talk about teams that really haven't played up to their potential. Like, that Michigan State Oregon game, at times, I, I just can't. I, it's the same thing we've been saying all year. I'm waiting for Oregon to show up. I'm waiting for Oregon to be Oregon. Like a couple of bad away. picks by Dylan Gabriel here. Like I, I don't know, man. Like I, the the number three team in the country. I I honestly don't know because I can't reward a Georgia team that has a loss or an Alabama team that has a loss. But also, I can't justify pole vaulting Oregon above them when I don't think on a neutral field right now Oregon would beat either of those teams. Yeah, and to, to your point, Fitz, I think about Oregon, I think about Penn State, I think about even a team like Miami, mm -hmm. and would those teams, do I think those teams would be an Alabama, a Texas, a Tennessee, a Georgia, no matter who they lost to? I don't. I don't think so. Like I, I know that's not where the how the rankings will, will play out on when the AP poll comes out, but I still would take Tennessee against Oregon tomorrow. I would take I would take Alabama against Penn State. 99 times out of 100 on a, on a neutral site tomorrow. So, you know, this thing will all play out. The great beautiful part is we have the 12-team playoff this year, but it'll be interesting to see. Fitz, how far will Alabama fall in the AP poll? That's, you are, like, the fourth or fifth person that has asked me this question. I don't know. I mean, because I I think probably the six, six-ish, seven-ish maybe? Yeah, I was like, going to say, you, like, will right? still be top seven? Yeah, yeah. But then you, you got to – this is the weird part. Like, are we going to put Georgia above them now? Like, it, uh, that that feels <laughs> icky to me because why play the games? Yeah. If we're, like, if I was in the college football playoff committee, I would still have to put Alabama above Georgia. Like, it, they have one loss, all things being equal. They both have one loss, but one of those is a head-to-head -head loss. Like, I, I value the games being played. So, I think they end up probably at six, six, seven. Uh, but that, that look, the one thing I know, Wherever they end up, it's going to piss everybody off. Like, SEC fans no are going to say, how could you do this? We know how good they are. And non-SEC fans are going to say, how could you not drop them to the teens? They lost to unranked Vanderbilt. So it's going to be yeah. – it'll be sexy no matter what. But I have no idea where <laughs> they end up. I – I will be intrigued to see how they balance the the Georgia Alabama of it all because you have to value head to head like the games that actually get played on a field that we can see like those have to matter for something. But as a team that just lost to Vanderbilt, deserve to be ranked above a Georgia team that lost to the what was Alabama at the time the number three team in the country number four team in the country like I don't know like this is why I would love to be it obviously. What happens within the AP poll, it doesn't matter. Like, it's not going to have any sort of influence in the college football playoff. There's a completely different committee for that. But these are the kind of nights that I wish that I could be a fly on the wall on the conversations that are being had of the powers that be, of, like, what matters, what's valued the most. Caroline, I'd like to just say one thing as we wrap up this show. You two sat on this show on Tuesday night and talked about how bad the slate of games was today. It was just going to be a brutal slate. There were no games to watch. It was going to be boring. Voila. We get Alabama going down. We get Tennessee going down. And the Vanderbilt. Anchor <laughs> Vanderbilt down, gets it baby. Done. I just had to remind you guys. Listen, it's always a good weekend of college football.
Okay, but yeah, I, I refuse to live by the edict if it's better <laughs> to be lucky than good and everything. College football got lucky today. It was not good luck. Like, yeah, it, it was a lucky good. slate for all of us. It it could have been an incredibly boring day of college football if all of these teams took care of their business. But it, it, it's too much to ask for, I guess. But uh, if you're listening on uh, your preferred podcast platform, not watching on YouTube, we we add that Fitz just whipped out a Vanderbilt football helmet truly out of the abyss. This is now the second time that Fitz has just whipped out a football helmet. You got UNLV. Like, when, when does it you ever got come Vanderbilt. Like, What's I got, the collection? I got the two- I got the two helmets that nobody ever needs for a college football podcast. Nobody's ever said, hey, guys, no one we need helmets in the helmet. background. <laughs> Do you have a UNLV and a Vandy helmet that we can get? Like, you know, no, 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 no. I mean, that, that's that's I am the one person in America that has a UNLV and Vandy helmet. And that happens to be week to week. I will say this. So I wore the UNLV helmet. They lost. I just put on the Vandy helmet. We'll see. I might be the I might be Uh-oh. the kiss of death. Uh oh, <laughs> it's a curse. It's a curse. Don't let Jason Fitz get his his grubby mitts on your team's football helmets. All right, that's going to do it for us today. That's Adam Brenneman. You can follow him on Twitter at Adam Brenneman 81 at Jason Fitz, and I am at Caroline Fenton 1. Like the podcast, subscribe to the podcast, review the podcast, do all those great things. Tell your friends, tell the people that you hate, tell a Vanderbilt fan. Shout out to Vanderbilt. Give them all of the love. Tell your friends. Appreciate all for being here. We will be back here on Wednesday morning. We're out.